What's shaking bacon? Today we're learning all about the mother of New York strip steaks, the strip loin. Now the strip loin is kind of a subprimal of a subprimal. And what I mean by that is you find the strip loin in the middle of the cow, right between the beef rib and the top sirloin. But the strip loin actually shares a bone with the tenderloin. And what steak is part New York strip and part tenderloin? A porterhouse, that's right. Or a T-bone, depending on the size of the tenderloin. But that's a discussion for another day. So we actually start with the short loin subprimal. That is then boned out and we get a boneless strip loin and a boneless beef tenderloin. So that's what I mean when I say it's like a subprimal of a subprimal. The more you know. Overall, strip loins are pretty simple. They're one of the first things I learned how to cut and I think they're really fun. This is the side that butts up against the beef rib and the other side is where it turns into the sirloin. The way that you can tell which side is which is that the sirloin end has this piece of silver running through the middle. This is what I refer to as a double muscle. And if you remember our top sirloin video, this piece right here looks like it would match up to the one side of the top sirloin. This strip loin is pretty flat all the way across, so it doesn't really give us a physical indication on the outside where the top sirloin or the double muscle will start. Sometimes the strip will have a physical indication. If you look at the fat cap, it'll be kind of flat and then kind of rise up near the end. And where that rising starts is where the double muscle is going to start. On average, I would say about the last 20% of the strip loin will be where that double muscle starts. And now we cut. We're gonna start by first facing up our piece. If we remember, the face is where we're cutting all of our steaks from, and it is a big flat side that is also perpendicular to the grain. I'm gonna be cutting off of this end. This would also be considered a face, but we're gonna be cutting off of this end. Slice a little bit off of the end so that the first steak we cut is even on both sides. And then this little piece will just be put to the side for now, for later. Now, when you're cutting a strip loin, there's a piece of grizzle that runs all the way across what I consider to be the front of the piece. Let's see if we can get a side. Yeah, it's right here. You can go ahead and remove a strip right across here to remove the grizzle before you cut. I like to remove it afterwards. It's just good to be aware of so that you know that there might be a little extra resistance when you're going to slice your steaks. Cutting New York strip steaks is pretty straightforward. We could just pick one thickness and slice steaks all the way down, but you know me, I like a little variety. So we're gonna cut some steaks in a variety of thicknesses. What I would consider a regular steak is about an inch thick, give or take about a fourth of an inch. For thick steaks, I usually go about an inch and a half to two inches thick. I like to keep at least one or two of these on hand because it gives me the options later of either cooking up a thick boy steak or cutting it in half and making two steaks out of it. That kind of versatility is why I love to keep thicker cuts and roasts on hand. You could line up a previous steak to then make sure that your next steak is the same size. And speaking of roasts, we could cut a strip roast if we wanted to. I think I only sold like three strip roasts total in my entire time at the store. And at least two of those were to the same customer on the same day. So they weren't a super popular thing for us to sell. So we really didn't cut them unless they were on sale. And I've actually never cooked one, but it's an option that I wanna make aware to you. I just won't be cutting one today. For thin steaks, I like to cut them about half an inch or less. Now, if you're having trouble cutting thin steaks, there's a few things that you can do. First of all, making sure your knife is really, really sharp. It, it duh, but a super crispy knife is life-changing. I also know that knife sharpening and upkeep can be a little intimidating, and a lot of us are really just flying by with a knife that's just sharp enough, but if you get that knife super duper crisp, it'll make everything easier. Another option, if you're having trouble cutting thin steaks, is to hold on to the side that you are cutting off of while you are slicing, like this. So if I were to turn this around, holding this and then slicing, that keeps this side really nice and stable. You could even go one step further and push this end up against something. Just kind of trying to stabilize the piece as much as possible will also help with getting thinner cuts. And then lastly, you could put the piece in the freezer for 30 minutes to an hour and let the meat firm up a little bit. That will also make it easier to achieve thinner slices. And if you cut a wonky steak, 
It's not the end of the world. You can pound it out thinner to use in another recipe. You could slice that wonky steak up into stir fry strips. Nothing to worry about. I'm using new knives today for the first time in like five years. I've had the same butcher knives for so long and I definitely am the type of person that once I know I like something, I'm just gonna stick with it. But I'm using the Butcher Wizards knives. We got them off Amazon. I'll make sure to link his channel below. We also posted a short where I unbox them with you guys and give my first impressions. This is my first time using them to cut with and they're a little bit different than my other knives. They're a little bit lighter, not as heavy, but they're still weighted really nicely for you know helping me drive cuts through so far i'm having a good time i love keeping thin steaks on hand because they thaw really fast and they cook really fast so if i ever forget to take a steak out of the freezer for dinner a pack of thin steaks to the rescue we're almost to where the double muscle is going to start ah ha ha you can see that the double muscle started here. You can kind of tell when the middle starts to kind of have a little bit more fat run through right here. That's kind of a sign that the double muscle is near. So here you can see the double muscle starts. We are going to deal with this separately. So I'm actually gonna go stick this in the fridge while we finish up on our steaks. Here's that little piece of grizzle I told you about earlier. When I was first learning how to cut these, my manager came up behind me to check my progress and he pointed this out and he said, we always cut this piece off in my meat department. You can't eat it and I'm not charging people for something that they can't eat. And I love that. And I think about that every single time I cut a New York strip steak and it really annoys me when I see strips out in the wild with this little piece of grizzle still attached. Mm. It's just a little thing, but it's the principle of the little thing, you know? So this is why I like to cut it afterwards because I can see how thick the grizzle is and I can keep as much meat behind on my steak without accidentally taking extra unnecessary meat off. That's just going to end up in trim. And this is also the perfect time to trim up the fat to your desired thickness. At the store, the standard was an eighth of an inch of fat. If you want a recommendation, I would say anywhere between an eighth of an inch to a fourth of an inch is good, but you hold the knife and therefore you make all the decisions. I'm gonna trim this a little bit, but not, not a done. I'm putting the piece of grizzle that we cut off in a separate pile from the fat because I'll keep the grizzle and the silver skin to throw into stock and then the fat will be for rendering. Keep an eye out for videos on both those things. So for steaks that come from the end of the strip that are closer to the rib, oftentimes they'll have a tail very similar to a ribeye. You can cut it off, you can leave it there. We would usually cut it off at the store because a lot of the time there's just a ton of fat surrounding a little baby piece of meat. This is our end steak. You see how the tail, there's really not a ton of meat, so in this case, I am going to trim the tail off. I'm gonna cut this little piece of meat out and put it in the pile for stock, and then put the chunk of fat in the fat pile. Sometimes you'll have thick silver skin on the bottom of the strip that you'd wanna remove. Sometimes there's a pretty thick layer of fat on the bottom too. This one was pretty clean on the bottom. Don't be surprised if you buy a strip and there's, you know, silver skin or chunks of fat on the bottom. Just cut them off like we would anything else. So that's all of our steaks done. I'm gonna go and put these in the fridge and grab our double muscle so we can work on that. Here is our double muscle. We could cut steaks all the way through this part. They would taste good, but honestly, they would just be kind of a bitch to eat because of the silver that runs directly through this piece. We weren't supposed to cut double muscle strip steaks at the store, so when I see them out at a store or at a restaurant, I'm not a fan, not a fan. Because at this point, you're only getting partial New York strip and partial top sirloin, but you're always going to be charged the New York strip price. And that's not cool, that's not cool. Lucky for us, merchandising this is fun. So I like to flip this over so that the fat cap is on the bottom. And then I will take my knife and start where the grizzly part is. And then I will slice and follow the line of fat all the way down to remove the fat cap. Really doesn't matter which knife you use, depending on the size of this piece, I'll usually use like one knife over the other. It is important to check both sides as you do this though. It's not perfect, but uh, honestly, that's pretty dang good. I'm going to go ahead and cut 
off the grizzly part from the rest of the fat because I'm gonna keep the fat for rendering, like I said, and the grizzle part will go in the pile for stock. And then if you wanted to trim this up a little bit, take what you can of the meat off to stick in the stockpile as well. That would definitely not be a bad idea. This is value. We can go ahead and trim off this bit of fat here carefully, checking both sides as we go. Next, I like to remove the top sirloin section from the strip section, just by following the seam of silver all the way across. Keep in mind that it does taper, it's not even on both sides, but it's pretty clear on both sides where the silver is. So we're just gonna follow that as closely as we can. Depending on the size of the top sirloin that you can get off of the devil muscle end, you could cut a top sirloin filet or two out of it. This one's pretty small. I could get a really small steak out of it, but I think I am just going to cut it up into another option instead. So I'm gonna take this moment to clean up any extra silver or fat that was in between the two pieces. There's also a seam right here, and I like to take this part off too, just for whatever we are going to cut out of this to be the cleanest as possible. But you just follow this seam right here Sometimes you can just pull it directly off. Do a little cleaning. So all of this makes excellent stir fry, kebab meat, chunks for stew. I think I'm going to do kebab meat. And the only real difference between when I cut kebab meat versus stew chunks is that for kebabs, I like pieces that are a little bit more square, obviously more uniform, and a little bit bigger. Whereas with stew chunks, I like the pieces to be a little smaller and I'm not super particular about the shape that they are. This piece of strip that's left after we remove the top sirloin portion off of it is awesome for kebab meat just because it's generally already very rectangular. <laughs> cut it down the middle. Try to cut even pieces. As you can see, it kind of tapers a little bit where the thickness of this piece right here is not the same as this. But if we were to turn it, it's about the same thickness now. So now I'm just going to try to match up the size that way. Now, because these pieces are flatter, I am going to cut stir fry out of these. This bit, I just like to cut with the grain to make it nice and skinny and then across the grain. There we have it. Look at all the variety we got today. Now, personally, I do love a good reverse seared thick boy steak, but I also love a quickly seared thin steak, and I love stir fry. I love everything we cut today, obviously, but let us know in the comments which of these cuts you're in the mood for and how you would prepare it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and learned something. If you did, please leave us a like, a comment, and subscribe for more bartending and butchery content. And until next time. There's a plane. This one's pretty flat, the sub. So we actually start with the short loin. Ooh, is there a piece of bone? This, uh, this is my house, this is for me, and uh, I'm just going to leave it like that. We're good, we're done. Let's go walk the dog.